Hello, my name's Kevin. I'm a vintage stereo addict, really bad. All right, I am super excited about this topic. I love integrated amplifiers. They are definitely my weak spot when it comes to vintage amplifiers, receivers, all that kind of good stuff. I am just a sucker for integrated, and I don't know why. I'm not saying they're better than receivers or separates. It's just what I seem to like. I don't listen to FM or AM, but if I get an integrated amplifier that I'm going to keep for a long time, I always end up buying a tuner that matches it, even though I never plan on using it. But that's the addict or the, the collector in me or a completionist, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you're watching this video, most likely you've caught the bug as well. I always say this is the best addiction you can have, at least as of now, in that you're not gonna lose your ass. You're buying the equipment at a decent price. In the last five years, it's only gone up. The only trouble I ever see is maybe with, with the partner, sneaking speakers in in the middle of the night, receivers and amplifiers uh, can cause problems. I've heard this story over and over and over and over, but uh, anyway, once again, yeah, I am stoked about this topic. I've got a really good list for you, I think. As far as the sound goes, I hate to say this, but they all sound like flagship or top of the line integrated amplifiers from the 70s. These all sound incredible. Uh, that's the best I can say for it. The other thing is, is we're talking about 50 year old amplifiers here. One might have been completely recapped. One might have had very little use. One might be, you know, used to death with a ton of corrosion in it. So, you know, it's not like we're talking about an amplifier that straight off the assembly line and they all sound the same. There are gigantic variances at this point with the way these units perform, depending on how they've been used, how they've been stored, and what service has been done to them. So it's not gonna do anybody any good in that the unit I have might sound completely different than the unit that you have because of the things I just listed before. So before I ramble on for too long, let's get into it. One more thing. Uh, I, I do wanna give a shout out to Randy at the Cheap Audio Man. He's been amazing. He's a great dude. And if for some crazy reason you don't follow him or, or watch his channel, uh, you really need to. As far as finding you the good bargains on good stereo equipment, I don't think anybody's doing it better. So Randy, for some reason, if you're watching, thank you, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, let's get into this video. I'll shut up. Okay, so these, once again, these aren't in order. Uh, I'm not, there's no hierarchy here. I'm not ranking these. Um, but the first one I wanna talk about would be the, uh, the Pioneer SA9100. And these were made from 1973 to 1975. They have a whole 60 watts per channel at eight ohms with 0.1 total harmonic distortion. So not a monster amplifier, although this was the flagship. 60 watts per channel is plenty. These things have plenty of cojones. Uh, if you know what I'm saying, good enough to drive just about any sides, maybe a, a newer uh, speaker that requires a ton of amperage. You're, you're not gonna have trouble driving Bose 901s or large advents or JBL 100s. Won't be an issue with a Pioneer SA9100. The things I like about the SA9100 would be, uh, one, there's a lot of them out there. So there's lots of parts that you're able to find, whether it's cosmetics or what have you. What I love about this integrated amplifier and that is it has control pots for Phono 2 for auxiliary two and for speaker B. So if you were ever wanting to AB, let's say two turntables or two sets of speakers or two line level inputs, this is an incredible integrated amplifier to have in that you can level match two inputs or two sets of speakers. There's one other integrated on this list that will do some of these things, but none that will do all these things. This is kind of a rare bird. So for that reason alone, it definitely makes the list because there, there are more high power Pioneer integrated amplifiers out there. I'm giving it to this one for those reasons right there. Not to mention the tuner that matches with these is really cool. You got the nice blue light back dial. It looks kind of like a, an X2X or an X3X series, which would be the same era. If you come across one of these, nab it. Just can't say enough good things about them. They are really cool. The negatives. 
And there are a couple negatives. These tend to have a lot of black-legged, noisy transistors. And what I mean by that is the little transistors and the, the amplifier board and the power supply, they started out with silver three-legged transistors and the corrosion has turned them black and it's working its way up into the body of the transistor causing noise and static in your audio which is no good so if you do get one of these i would plan on if it hasn't been refurbished i would plan on spending a little bit of money getting those transistors changed out and prices for these i see them range anywhere between you know 500 to 1200 dollars depending on condition and what level of service has been done to it. So you're not, you're not gonna have to fork out a huge amount to own one of these and uh, a cool piece, especially with those, those three potentiometers in the back there, really unique. So a 9100 integrated amplifier. And the next one on our list, the Marantz 1030, uh, 1973 to 1978. These are only 15 watts per channel with 0.5 total harmonic distortion. And I know I just heard a lot of people gasp in that I didn't put a monster Marantz integrated amplifier on this list. But there's there's a good reason for that. It's not just because I wanted a, a, an entry level integrated amplifier on the list. I've got several customers, these are Marantz diehards, super fanboys that literally own almost every single Marantz piece of gear from the 70s and at least three or four of these guys and every single one of them says the same thing they'll say I've got you know the 2385 I've got the 2325 for some reason I'm always listening to my 1030 and my 2015 receiver the little 15 watt per channel units they say that they they're just they've got something about them they're sweeter, they like the sound of them more. The only thing I could think of with that is a lot of times, the more bells and whistles you add to a unit, the more connections are happening, the more circuitry your audio is going through. So the simpler, a lot of times is better. You know, you look at those old tube amplifiers that everybody raves about, and there's really not a lot going on there. You know, you're bringing your audio in, you get a couple stages of amplification and it kicks it out. There's not a bunch of filters and EQs and a lot of things that your audio could be diminished by. So the simplicity of the Marantz 1030, I think is the beauty of it. I think Marantz is the king of receivers in that I think their receivers are incredibly looking and incredibly built. I don't think they spend as much time on their integrated amplifiers. And I don't know why, but they're usually on the boring side to me, or they're even worse, they have cheap looking five band EQs on the front of them. And for some reason, when I see a five band slider EQ on something, I immediately go, oh man, that looks cheap to me. You know, I do think there's a huge tax on a Marantz receiver in that I have been known to dead stare a customer right in the eye and I'll go, you know you've been seduced by the blue lights, right? you know that you're paying a Marantz tax because that's a Marantz, because the same receiver, the same build quality, and let's say, you know, a Pioneer or a Yamaha is most likely maybe two or $300 cheaper per watt, but they did such a good job with the design of their receivers. And what draws me to them is they're always symmetrical. A lot of other receivers, uh, why they're designed well, Marantz nailed symmetry. And I think that's what draws me to it. And I like the blue lights too, I'm not gonna lie. It's just, I don't know why they didn't dress up their integrateds a little bit more, but neither here nor there. Grab a small Marantz 1030. There's a ton of them out there. You can pick them up cheap and they sound incredible. And so it's a win, win, win in my opinion. I don't really know of any negatives except for maybe some people might feel they're a little bit they're a little bit boring in the looks department but it's not all about look a nice 1030 marantz and a pair of decently efficient speakers and you've got an amazing setup for cheap that's the marantz 1030 and definitely has its place on this list for sure all right the next one on my list and one that i do personally own is an accuphase e202 from 1974. this is definitely probably the most rare on the list these were really popular in Japan. I don't think they sold as many 
in the States. A lot of people consider AccuPhase to be the Japanese version of Macintosh. The build quality on these is extremely good. They, uh, this actually has modular boards in it, meaning you can remove the boards uh, without removing any wires to work on it. They're a text dream. They're built really well. They look incredible. They've got nice big VU meters on them. Some claim these have the best phono stage of any 70s uh, stereo. I don't know if I'd say it has the greatest phono stage. However, I do love the fact that once again, this is one of those units that features a potentiometer for the second phono stage. So you can balance your two turntables. If you have a cartridge that's hotter than the other and you're wanting to make recordings, I assume that's what they probably did back in the day. If you wanted to, you know, you didn't want to stop your tape player from running. You wanted to play or record one song off of one record and then go right into the next song off another record. You could control the volume pot and kind of make a seamless tape recording. So really cool feature there. These also have a speaker damping three switch position attenuation as well. So if you have really efficient speakers, you can kind of adjust it, or if they're a heavy draw, you can adjust it, which is another really cool feature. They didn't skimp on anything with the E202. If you can get your hands on one, grab one. That is the beauty of it for some reason. Well, I think because they didn't sell a lot of these in the States, not a lot of people know to look for them. And grabbing one of these for 1500 bucks, in my opinion, is a steal. I would not sell mine for 1500 bucks any day. I think it, they're way undervalued, and I think that's just because they're kind of rare in the United States. That is one of the negatives, though. They are kind of rare, and when you get a rare piece, you have a lack of access to parts like volume knobs or any kind of cosmetic uh, items. You know, if you need a volume knob or a bass knob or something, you're going to be looking for a while. They're just, you know, it's not like a Pioneer SX780 that they made you know, thousands of them and there you literally can get any part you want really reasonably. That's not the situation with an AccuPhase E202. But if you can get one in good shape, they're great to work on, they're easy to work on, and they are an awesome unit. I don't know if I said they're 100 watts per channel at eight ohms with 0.15 total harmonic distortion, but if I didn't, that's what they are. Definitely really cool integrated amplifier. All right, and the next one on the list, and the only American integrated amplifier, and once I said American, I'm sure most of you went, oh, it's a Macintosh. And yes, it is. It's a Macintosh MA6100, made from 1972 to 79, which is a really long run. They were 70 watts per channel with 0.2% total harmonic distortion. This is one of those integrated amplifiers that, you know, when I think of 70s Macintosh, this is what I think of. This is what I remember seeing when I first saw Macintosh was something from this line, from this era. It's the, uh, well, I've got one behind me, um, right? Let's see if I can, right there. That's a Macintosh 6100. It's got the classic Macintosh look to it. The, the backlit glass with, with the green writing and the red luminated power. Uh, just a really cool piece. They look amazing. These things are built, man, they're built. Every time you get into a Macintosh, every tech will tell you the same thing. They had the technician in mind, and that's not something a lot of companies do, but that's why Macintosh holds its value. That's why Macintosh has its initial value. It's not just, it's not just aesthetics with Macintosh. They took everything to the next level. I tell people at the shop quite often, anybody that's been there a lot will hear me say, all roads lead to Macintosh, and they do. It's just the natural progression in that you get your flagship Pioneers, you get your flagship Marantzes, you get your flagship Sansuis, and eventually you end up selling a couple of those and buying a Macintosh. The service that's still available for Macintosh is still unparalleled. You know, calling Pioneer or Sansui or, you know, even Yamaha to get information or parts on their older pieces from the 70s you're gonna find nothing but a dial tone because uh, they are literally gonna hang up on you and then laugh. Macintosh, on the other hand, is different. I have a new faceplate for my Macintosh 2105 amplifier. It was made two years ago. How it works is you order the faceplate, they wait for enough people to order the faceplates and then they make a small batch. You know, you might have to wait a little bit, 
but uh, I didn't wait that long. I, I believe it was maybe maybe three or four months and I had mine. And I don't know of another company that you can buy pieces for from their gear from the, from the 60s and 70s. So there are reasons why Macintoshes are valued so much. The negatives would be, I'm not a fan of power switches incorporated into volume controls, as in there's not a separate on off switch on, on the 6100. You, when you first turn the volume, you hear it click and that turns on the power. So there's no setting the volume and leaving it. That's the only thing I don't like about the Macintosh 6100. The next one on the list is a Yamaha CA 2010 or 1010, 1977 to 1980. Using the class B, it's 120 watts per channel. Using the class A, it's 30 watts per channel. And that's at 0 0.03 total harmonic distortion. And yes, these are both class A and class B. That's one of the reasons this integrated amplifier is on the list. I don't know of another integrated amplifier that has this option. Being able to switch from class A to class B is very cool, even though most people will say it's very subtle, and it is. However, if you have the right speakers and you have the right room for it, I do think you can hear a pretty significant difference between the class A and the class B. Class A, Class B, that's a question for Rob to get into more detail. I don't know the topology well enough to not confuse people more than they are. So I, one of these days, we're gonna get Rob uh, in a video and we'll just ask him questions that I don't know the answers to, which is the more deep tech stuff. But uh, Rob's a super cool guy. He's the main tech at the shop and he is insanely smart. So. That'll be coming soon. If you come up with a question, jot it down. I'll make an announcement saying that we're going to do a, a live stream or something with Rob and to have your questions ready because uh, what a wealth of knowledge he is. Anyway, back to the Yamaha. I, I pulled out the 2010 or the 1010. They're very similar. The, the 2010 is just almost a unicorn. Uh, you see quite a bit more 1010s around, although I have had a 2010 and I sold it, unfortunately. Uh, the good things with these, uh, the Class AB, like I talked about, VU meters, can't go wrong with VU meters. VU meters sell everything. That's why you see VU meter standalone boxes get the money they get. There's something, it's, it's like a lava lamp or a color organ. There's something about watching meters bounce uh, to the music that is mesmerizing. So you get some nice VU meters with the, uh, the 1010 or the 2010. They are unbelievably undervalued, in my opinion. These sell between 900 to 1200. I honestly think that is almost criminal for how good of a unit these are. Uh, the only negative I can really think of is they are kind of a pain in the butt to work on. They are notorious for stacking boards and not having long enough wires for servicing purposes. They call it a slack loop. And they didn't really give you much of a slack loop, meaning you have to desolder wires in order to move boards to get to other boards. But Sansui's guilty of this too. Everybody's guilty of maybe not making the tech the high priority, but um, yeah, you'll see some techs really complain about working on Yamaha gear from the mid to late 70s. That's the only negative I can really come up with. That is the Yamaha CA 2010 and 1010. And the last one on the list, and in my opinion, my opinion, the grail of 70s integrated amplifiers is the Sansui AU 20,000. These were made from 1975 to 1977. They're 170 watts, eight into eight ohms at 0 0.05 total harmonic distortion. I've owned one of these since before I opened Skylabs. It's one of the first integrated amplifiers I've ever owned. I love this piece a lot. Uh, the build quality is exceptional and the fit and finish is unparalleled in my opinion. I just think the design, the knob choices, everything, all the detail, is a 10 out of 10 on this integrated amp. It's got nice VU meters. It's got plenty of selections for cartridge loads, two phono inputs, plenty of power. And yeah, I, I just, uh, I love looking at this thing. And if anybody tells you that looks are not important with 
stereo equipment, I am going to completely call BS on that. I used to install automation and home theater equipment for a company here in Des Moines, and we got paid a lot of money to hide current electronics. The black boxes that have no character at all, we would get paid to put them in a closet and then con control that equipment with a remote for a reason. You don't wanna put a Sansui AU 20,000 in a closet. These are meant to be looked at. They're meant to be a focal point in the room. As with most of these on the list, I'm not, I'm not saying the, the 20,000 is so far beyond the 1010 or the, the 9100, because it's not. I do think, for me, I, I just think they really nailed this one. But there are some negatives, just like anything else, and that would be, and a few, uh, the AU series from Sansui have the same problem and that is their switches and volume pots. They require cleaning too often, in my opinion. And I have gone into mine with, you know, D100, D5, every solvent and lubricant you can think of to try and limit the amount of dead spots or static in the knobs. And it seems like it's a once a year type of thing. When I do it once a year, I get a good 11 months out of it before it starts acting up again but these require switch cleaning quite often at least from the ones i've seen and this would be the the au line down the board the other thing about the sansui au line is they're all good don't shy away from like a 505 or a 101 those smaller integrated amplifiers from sansui are incredible i think we've had them all 719s they are just incredible units they sound amazing they look great so yeah i'm definitely always happy to purchase a sansui au series because they are easy to sell and that was the sansui au 20,000. uh that was at the top of the list once again they weren't numbered but i would definitely give that my favorite so and there you have it that was my list of favorite integrated amplifiers from the 70s hopefully i didn't steer you too wrong if you haven't been in the market for an integrated amplifier, man, they're fun. Maybe sell a receiver and try out an integrated, see if you like it more. Appreciate everybody that's that's common lately that's subscribed. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. We're, we're gonna hope to get a couple videos out a week rather than just one like we are now, but running a shop and doing these videos by myself really takes a good chunk of time and um, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and get to two videos a week. We've got topics till we're blue in the face. So uh, subscribe if you like, share it. If you know somebody you think would like this information, definitely share it. We'll see you next week. Thanks.